Welcome back. We continue with the program. Thank you so much for staying with us this far. We now move on to our health segment and today we're going to be focusing on sexual and reproductive health given we are marking the 16 days of activism which is all about the fight against gender-based violence perpetrated against women uh, more so and also in line with what we will be marking tomorrow with the World AIDS Day and with us in studio to help with this conversation we have the pleasure of having one Rachel Mukami, who is a sexual and reproductive activist. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am very well. Thank you so much for making time to be with us today. Thank you too. All right. So maybe yeah. we could start um, with getting to know a bit about what you do in your line with activism around sexual and reproductive health. Where did that start from? Okay. So, like the way you said, my name is Rachel Mwekali, mm. not Mwekali. Oh, Mwekali. <laughs> apologies, apologies, apologies. Yeah. So um, I'm a Pan African feminist, mm -hmm. activist, and community organizer. Uh, from Mother and from Assessment, and I convene a social movement called Coalition for Grassroots Human Rights Defenders, where we focus a lot on ending violence against women, mm -hmm. human rights in general, and also around sexual and reproductive health and rights. Yes. And uh, when I say sexual and reproductive health and rights, it's also because um, the Constitution of Kenya also guarantees us that um, we have a right uh, when it comes to our sexual reproductive health and rights. That's also like accessing contraceptive, mm -hmm. family planning and uh, also information and uh, not forgetting also things to do with sexual transmitted diseases mm -hmm. and i like the way you have also like a blend uh being 16 days of activism and the kind of challenges also women have gone through even during the pandemic mm -hmm. accessing and youth uh, like myself accessing sexual reproductive health and uh, services but also tomorrow being world AIDS day mm -hmm. uh, and also quoting um from nigani campaign uh, which is about also um caring about ourselves like how accessible also let's say condom mm -hmm. in our public spaces and uh how is the government providing in terms of, as much as it's our right but also how is our responsibility in terms of ensuring also we holding uh the leaders into account to ensure that we have um um like condom and contraceptive to ensure that uh, we don't lose also like uh, a lot of youthful population also when it comes to now even the infection of HIV rates. All right. Yeah. And that actually brings me to now this components of sexual and reproductive health that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Let's narrow them down. And I'd mm -hmm. like for us to start with um, the aspect about adolescent health, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like for you to just base from within your area, the community-based organization that you run, when it comes to adolescent health, understanding the reproductive system straight from the school to the home setup, how do they complement each other to just ensure that this adolescent understands what reproductive health Health and sexual health is all about and, and I think also being a youthful person and um, going through this 844 system mm -hmm. I think there's a big gap in terms of how we do the education around sexual productive health and rights mm -hmm. and I think it's in classics mm -hmm. when the topic comes and it's usually mostly about uh, reproduction like um, um, these are the body works uh, and about the pregnancy, body parts, yeah. body parts, but not into details. Uh, into details like how does our body functions? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you're having sex, uh, what are the uh, like sh um, consequences? Most of the time, it'll be like you'll get pregnant, but you don't look diseases. We don't look also, yes, if you get pregnant, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time even, this the, the other thing people need to, to be talking and looking up to it, it comes with the pregnancy and that's why you'll see there's a lot of quacks mm -hmm. also that are able to do unsafe abortion that also um, make the life of, like we lose also like a lot of young women and girls through that it shouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. But in reality is that we have to dig it deeper and deeper in terms of ensuring the information mm -hmm. is being given the right of information without saying, you see this is the problem like we want to bury our heads in the sand and assuming people, people youthful or I don't say they're not having sex mm -hmm. they're having sex but what is the kind of information you're giving them in terms of yes if there's condoms yeah yeah they are can you use it mm, but we are not telling them it? go and use it mm. but at least they know this information because if you can look also like um, even like during the pandemic um, the number of girls that also have been violated by also men mm. um, it's also like um, you find there was not accountability in terms of also the guys, but at the same time accountability in terms of the information that was there in the public. So you find as adolescent girl or adolescent boys, you'll go finding information to your peers, which most of the time it's not accurate. Mm -hmm. Because the system that is supposed to teach you is not teaching you 
and giving you the information that is well needed. It's a bit misguided. Yeah. And that brings me to now the next aspect, and this is all about contraception, and it has been a subject of yeah. such um, <laughs> argument, a mm. little back and forth, yes here, no there, mm. maybe here. When it comes to um, allowing information and access to these contraceptives, from where you stand, from what you have seen interacting with the different people in the different spaces that you have, what is the general feel about contraceptives and more so where the younger population is involved and in this particular case, the adolescents? I think it's very clear and important to have the conversation around contraceptive, mm -hmm. not family planning. There's a difference. The difference like for our family planning is where already you have had kids you want to plan but contraceptive is where a point I want to prevent pregnancy occurring. Mm -hmm. And the majority of my youthful population which is 75% of in the country is that we want the information or we know the information but the service provider in our public hospitals are not friendly to younger population or to youthful population. So you'll find as a young woman who you haven't had kids or children, if you're going to a public hospital and tell them I want to access contraceptive, mm -hmm. there's that demonization. I've experienced that as much as an activist I am in our public hospital. So you find it becomes a barrier for more young people now they'll want to go to a private hospital to seek the service, which shouldn't be the case. Because already the constitution gives us that right that uh, health should be, it's, it's a human rights issue, which also reproductive and health services fall under that. But I like the work also that has been, been done by the, uh, from Nigani and also the Sexual Reproductive Health uh, and Rights Network, where they're trying to link communities uh, with service provider, mm -hmm. and these are youthful also uh, people, on how to access contraception. And now when you're asking that, it reminds me on a conversation and a workshop that I'm attending at the moment, uh, organized by Athena Initiative, where it's bringing a lot of young people, young women from different uh, backgrounds, to try and understand uh, these are the gaps, mm -hmm. this is the reality, and the girls are asking us, how do we disseminate this information to a point that uh, they're able to have the right information and, and the education, so that they're able to, to make like um, decisions that are, are not affecting their lives, mm -hmm. but decisions that are also improving their lives. Yeah. All right. And that in also comes the question about age and what information is appropriate for what age. How should we go about teaching our children mm. uh, about their sexual and their reproductive health and rights in a way that their age accommodates that and they're able to understand and comprehend? I, I think it, it, it's important, but at the same time, you're looking also in terms of the age. Um, it's not like black and white, it's a gray area mm -hmm. uh, to a point that uh, there's consent because you know as much as you're under 18, you're under your, your parents or guide, um, uh, guide, guardian, guardian yeah. like uh, in terms of the responsibility. But at the same time also, would we want to deny the information to the same kids and then it comes with a bigger consequence or would we want to find a way or now we are telling them the reality. Like for example, when you start your period most of the time, even when you're, like even when I starting my period, people will be quick and saying, don't, don't play with boys, you'll get pregnant. But you're not telling them, don't sleep with boys, you see. So it's very important like, to ensure, like, how do we give the information? And what are the modalities that we give information? Like in the communities we work with, even the kids we work with, we're like very clear. Yes, I know there are those who will say we should not give to this level, but it's, it's important just to say, if you're sleeping with a boy or a girl, these are the consequences. You'll either get pregnant mm -hmm. or you'll either get STIs or STDs at least you have the information. But the way things are evolving, the way the youthful population is evolving, and the way the, the, the adolescent uh, population is evolving, if you are not giving them the right information, they'll go to the internet. And that comes in the role of the parents, because you, we are living in a time where parents have, le have left this responsibility to the teacher to teach the children about your sexual uh, reproductive system, and then the teacher also expects the parent to complement yeah. this conversation back home. How then do we bring the efforts for, from both the teacher's side and the parent's side to complement each other, all in an effort to benefit this child? For me, if you ask me, it needs to be a collaborative work, mm -hmm. both from the parent's side and from the teacher's side. It should not be left to the parents and to the teacher because the moment you do that is the moment now we, we get these consequences nowadays we are having mm -hmm. like we have seen cases like even during covid where we, we had cases even the media was highlighting where um, there were a group of also adolescent um, um, teenagers that um, had to go and drink and had sex it was a whole discussion in the country but for me it was like one as much as we are complaining 
this is, these are things that are happening, at least this one has come to the public, but at least they use protection. Because the reality, if we can't, all of us have this discussion, people are having sex, kids are having sex, even amongst themselves. But we should not leave it to the teachers. Mm -hmm. It's any space, if you ask me even now we are heading, it's any space that is being created, whether by the public or private space, even in churches. Mm -hmm. These are the conversation we need to start having. Instead of demonizing and telling people you're fornicating, but the reality is they're having sex. All right. Give them the right information to protect themselves. So clearly there's a challenge when it comes to um, empowering our children with this information. And let's talk a bit about, you know, these points of information. How available should they be made to these kids to enable them make better decisions? Because at the end of the day, they are still engaging in whatever they're engaging in, but with the absence of knowledge that they need. What, which points do you feel are effective when it comes to the dissemination of this information? You know, from what you've mentioned, you know, we have church leaders, we have hospitals, we have parents, teachers from what you have experienced like, which like is for the best example approach? like um you see on, on the website of from nigania there's a lot of information and i maybe allow the public to look at it um about access uh to this information and also to um service provider and con contraceptive but at the same time let's look f like for example here in the media can we can we have programs that we're able to talk about the issue these, these issues like the way during the covid we'll talk about washing your hands let's have a clear conversation around sex sexuality and about also um sexual reproductive health and right into detail not just um these are your body parts these are the, are the function mm. but at the same time like trying to see what are the other ways like for example i've seen communities um most of people have become creative even the activism part where people are coming with skits that uh, people are performing and then people are reacting with comments and things uh, that are able to push in terms of knowledge understanding. Because not everybody will go and read at the book and not everybody in Kenya has that privilege of also internet. But the point of ensuring like even the local organization and local initiative, even the governments like the local hospitals, mm. how effective are they? Like now tomorrow is World AIDS Day. Are we having this discussion? Are we linking World AIDS Day with sexual reproductive health and rights? Because they are connected. Because mm -hmm. it's about safer sex, it's about uh, condom usage, it's about knowing your status. But if we can link, because also it's personal, and that's why like it comes from a point of also self care. Like mm -hmm. I have to jolly myself. Does it mean you jolly to a point? Uh, I'm able to know it about my body, not someone else's body. Yeah. And I think we need to personalize that and politicize that, that it's about you from a personal perspective. And uh, at the same time, um, ensuring when people also are able here in public to talk about it, you don't demonize them. All right. Because I think in Kenya we do that. We are good in demonizing people when it comes to sexual reproductive health and right. Mm -hmm. We are like, oh, so you think that information is too much, but yeah, we are doing that. And speaking of demonizing, we're also living in a time where our young uh, population are engaging in transactional sex just because of the poverty levels, exactly. you know, consequently yeah. leading to a myriad of unexpected consequences for them. Yeah. How can we help alleviate this problem? Poverty being a driving factor when it comes to irresponsible sexual behavior. And, and I think it's, it's, it's key and it's important understanding that um, there's poverty, and uh, most of the time, even when you're we're talking about transactional sex, like here also we need to look at it in terms of patriarchal system and structure that works against women and girls. Like here, there's a, there's someone who has money, and he thinks the only way. Um, uh, to take advantage of a girl is giving them the money and sleeping with them. Mm. So th this also should be part of also like now looking in terms of violence. It's a part of violence uh, mm. that also during these 16 days of activism you're talking about. And for me, it's also it's clear that 16 days of activism should not be only from 25th to 10, but it should be like on our daily level. These are the things that are happening. But how are we calling it out? Yes. How is the government structure like um, supportive and system such so that when these cases or we find someone has taken advantage of a younger girl, mm -hmm. we able to hold them into account? So it's very important and key. And knowing it's violence, we can't remove that. Yes, it's transactional without bringing the word that it's violence and holding people into account and the, and the perpetrators into account because of taking advantage of the small girls because of their poverty level. All right. Yeah. Now, as we bring the conversation to a close, just your call to action message to everyone who's watching or listening to us today. Number one, in line with um, when it comes to sexual and reproductive health, understanding it is it starts with you as yeah. an individual before it flows to the next person. Number two, 
looking at the 16 days of activism when it comes to ending gender-based violence against women and number three world aids day tomorrow all about you know understanding the status of hiv and aids and sexually transmitted diseases along with that yeah. so i think for me it's one government need to invest more money mm -hmm. on sexual reproductive health and rights um and uh, research is there um and also in their shelves so more money more awareness at the same time also like normalizing the discussion around sexual reproductive health and rights beyond just condom to other means and other options because i think most of the time also there are no options like you go to hospital a doctor hasn't um like done the uh diagnosis like which which method suits you mm -hmm. but it's important just to normalize that um in terms of uh also the facility being friendly to young people at the same time um we need to encourage um um safer sex uh, especially to our youthful population um in terms of it's not bad like go and access it and go and ask to that hospital but also holding the government accountable in terms of ensuring that these facilities are available to their young people these facilities are available uh to the public to the citizens to be able to um to be able to access the services uh but at the same time it's our collective work to end violence against women and girls yes it's not the responsibility of women it's the collective work of citizens not women every and individual to be everyone yeah and then being tomorrow as well it's day also let's stand in solidarity with our brothers our sisters um our our people in terms of also ensuring that we're able to support them and not um, discriminate them mm -hmm. uh, at the same time ensuring that also we're able to center in the conversation also accessibility of also the medication because we realize even during covid it was mm -hmm. hard to get the medication yes, for ARVs. Yes. so it's really important to ensure that um, when they're not getting that medication is also violence so we need to move from a point of just saying uh, it's here but to a point of implementing mm -hmm. yeah all right. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. This has all uh, been about uh, sexual and reproductive health and particularly focusing on the younger population given they are the majority of those in our world. But for now we want to end it at that particular point. Remember we are still marking the 16 days of activism which uh, began on the 25th of November and will be running up until the 10th of December. We are going to be having consequent discussions to build up on that. And of course tomorrow being a World AIDS Day we will be having a conversation uh, with one of the representatives from the uh, National AIDS Control Council. For now, we want to wish you a lovely day. We have been speaking with Rachel Mwikali, who is a sexual and a reproductive health activist. Thank you so much once again. Thank you too. All it right. It was a really nice conversation. Fantastic. For now, it is goodbye. See you tomorrow.